like, amen. But Moses did an incredible job for contribution. Thank you so much, bro. You know, as you guys may have already known, the marrieds are away at the marrieds retreat, amen. And, and that's why they're away from us today. But we as the campus, as the woman of wisdom, as the singles, as the teen ministry are fired up to serve God today. You know, I am honored and humbled to preach the message of God today to you this morning. But let's get right on down to business. Open God's word to the book of Luke. In the book of Luke, in chapter 11, we're going to read here in verse 1. Now, I want you to notice two things. Notice what Jesus had finished doing, and notice what Jesus teaches right here in verse 1. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. And the church said, Amen. you know, we are taught by Jesus what prayer should be all about. We always pray for what means the most at your core. That's what's on our hearts when we pray. So right here, we understand that prayer tells you a lot about somebody. I mean, when some of us pray, I mean, it's scary. You can see how close or lack of close someone is to God. I remember my first prayers when I was young. Man, they were bad. <laughs> I didn't know what to say to God. I didn't know how to connect to God. But I did learn. And right here, we got to learn today. The seven most important things to Jesus' core right here. Number one. A personal relationship with God. When Jesus prays, he calls God Father. Now, in the Old Testament, God was never really re re called this way at this term. He was always spoken to as sovereign God, sovereign Lord, Lord Almighty. He was always speaking to, not in a personal connection, just like Jesus does right here, but we as disciples, we get to have a personal relationship with God. Number two, praising him. Jesus prays. And he says, hallowed be your name. People are naturally inclined to worship something. And whether we worship the things of this world or we idolize our own very selves or our careers or our jobs, Jesus was all about worshiping God Almighty. Amen. Number three, the kingdom of God. The word kingdom, for those who appreciate nuggets, is used 114 times in the Gospels alone. Jesus valued the kingdom. Do you value the kingdom of God? Number four, the meeting of our needs. Jesus was thankful to God, saying, God, give us our daily bread. I mean, for us, naturally, we're in America, and a lot of us are very spoiled. We are granted food on a regular basis. We can go almost anywhere at any corner, and you'll see a restaurant, more than likely a McDonald's. And in that way, we are surrounded by our needs potentially being met. But for a lot of people, especially in these times, this wasn't promised. So they were thankful when God was able to meet their needs. Number five, the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness is so important because in order to have peace with God, we've got to have forgiveness of God. 
And that forgiveness leads to a harmony, a connection, a true relationship with God and each other that only comes from forgiveness. Number six, Jesus says, lead us not into temptation. Number six is the freedom from the sins that allow us or prevent us from building a relationship with God himself. And then we got to ask ourselves, what was number seven? Number seven is subtle. And number seven is something that many of us often overlook. But there's three subtle words that Jesus mentions in his prayer. He mentions we, he mentions us, and he mentioned our. Number seven is one another. Jesus valued the relationships that we get to have in his eternal kingdom. He valued discipleship. He valued the kingdom. He valued a relationship with God. He valued forgiveness of sins. He valued staying in harmony with God. And we've got to value what God values at his core. Today, we're going to study out a topic that many of us need to be enlightened about. This is the very topic that we were all brought a part of when we were baptized. When we were baptized, we were added to this ministry, and the title of the lesson is the Ministry of Reconciliation. Before we get into the ministry, though, we got to get into prayer a little bit deeper. You know, it's not just important to know what Jesus mentioned. It's also important to know what Jesus did not mention. There's five words that we oftentimes use in our prayers that Jesus deliberately excluded from his prayers. You guys want to know what they are? Five words. Me, I, mine, myself, and mine. These are the five words that Jesus deliberately did not use in his prayer. You got to ask yourself, why is that? Well, we know that Jesus teaches in Luke 9 that we are to deny our very selves. And according to his word, that self needs to be crucified so you can live for someone else. We don't pray just for our own will. We pray for God's people to meet and be supportive of each other. This is the prayers of Jesus. What we got to do is personalize the message. So I ask you, have you been praying what Jesus would taught you to pray? I know for myself, in moving to Los Angeles, I, I came here very excited to serve, very eager to be with you guys and to be in the family here in Metro Heights. And... In my coming, I knew that the first thing I needed to do was find somewhere where I needed to pray to God. So I found myself a prayer place and called it my prayer spot. And this is where I was going to go and pray to my awesome God on a regular basis. And that was in the early days of me moving here. And yet it took me about a week and a half to start to go repeatedly. And in my, my nature, I started to realize that deep down, I had a selfishness. In my prayers, I wasn't praying for the disciples of the region as much as I should have. I didn't have a prayer list with all the names of the brothers and sisters that God had given me as a leader to serve. I wasn't a man that was willing to go above and beyond and and get that prayer list together so I could pray for every brother and sister by name. And I realized this, and I just started crying. I started crying because I realized how selfish I had gotten. I had fallen out of touch with the relationships that God was granting me to have here in Metro Heights. And in my prayers, I, I really had to snap out of it and 
And my sadness quickly changed to anger. Because I was mad at who I allowed myself to be. I was mad that I allowed my selfishness to rule my life. You see, I gave in to a sin of falling out of touch and ascetic heart. And the sin of ascetia is really when you allow yourself to no longer feel connected to people. Or no longer feel connected to God. We start to make excuses when we struggle with the sin of acedia. When you notice something's wrong and you don't do anything about it. When you know there's an issue and you say, my leader is going to take care of it. When you see that there's something happening in your heart and you fail to engage it. And I allow the sin of acedia to steep into my prayers with God. And when I realized this, I knew I needed to repent. And oh, baby, I got a prayer list. I got a prayer list with all the names of the brothers and sisters that God has given me to serve in the South Bay, man. I'm fired up to be with you guys. I've decided I'm no longer going to allow selfishness to rule my life. But I'm going to be a real Christian, a real disciple, and serve God's people. Self was never the motivation of Jesus' ministry. It was never in his prayers. He didn't pray for himself. He was praying about you. He was praying about the kingdom because he valued what God values. Do you believe that is your prayer life as well? You know, when Jesus prayed in John 17, he said, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. See, Jesus' prayer was to prepare God to be inspired that he himself could be a vessel to bring God the glory that God deserves. He even goes on to say, God, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you have granted me to do. Jesus, in his prayers in John 17, was remembering the purpose of why he was here in the first place which was to finish the work that God has granted him to do. In a similar way, that is why you're still here today. You ever wondered why you get baptized and don't just go to heaven? I used to have that thought when I was a young Christian. But the reason why we stay here is really because God has a work for you to finish in your lifetime. The reason you're still alive is God is really preparing you to do the mission, to do the evangelization, and to be a part of the ministry of reconciliation. You know, I had a funny thought the other day. And I was wondering, you know, what, what made God connect in his relationship with Jesus? You ever thought about that? How did Jesus... And God just flourished so much. How were they so connected? What, what made him tick? How did it work? And then I read and thought about verse 1. When he says, one day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. We oftentimes can overlook this scripture. But the word certain place is used in 27 of 29 most prominent translations of the entire Bible. That means that Bible translators agreed that Jesus had a certain place where he prayed to his God. That means that Jesus had a specific location. This place where nobody else needs to know about. This place where, where he separated, he knew where he was going to do. Where he could just talk, laugh cry and overcome and draw near to his amazing father in heaven you know in the old testament god was feared and god was revered people were afraid of god i mean to step in the old testament days i mean you had to be a holy person to come up to god you can't even step into his temple you know what i'm saying you had to walk on eggshells walking up to god it was something that people were scared of. They respected him that much. And yet people of this generation, they don't even care. Man, we have little respect for God. 
We don't have the respect. Some of us sometimes we are talking to people while other people are praying. Having our own prayers when other people are praying. We're, we're not realizing who we're talking to. We're talking to the Lord Almighty who created you. And he cares so much. He's willing to listen to every thought, every saying, every statement, every attitude of your heart. God cares for you that much. We've got to be men and women who literally go and pray to God. I want to give you a challenge. We ain't even talking about the ministry of reconciliation yet. I want to give you a challenge. In order to be close to God, you got to take this challenge. Find a place. You choose a place where you will pray to God like Jesus did. Have a certain place. Find a prayer spot. Somewhere where you can connect to God and not have to worry about what other people think. Not being concerned about if other people see you. I've been there. It's kind of weird. You know what I'm talking about? When you're praying and you want to cry and you're like, dang, that person's right there. I don't want to. I don't want to look weird. You know, they're going to ask me, why am I crying? You know what I mean? You, you want to find somewhere where it's you and the Lord. Amen. Where you can be at peace. You can be yourself and you can just get it out. You guys with me here? Let's dive into the ministry of reconciliation. Let's turn our holy scriptures to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I started there because you can't get the ministry unless you get God's. We got to start with God in order to do his work. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Bible reads in verse 16, Paul writes, as we know in ICCM, this isn't the second letter, this is the fourth letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. And in, four, in Corinthians chapter 5 verse 16, the Bible says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And the family of God said, Amen. You know what's powerful right here is we got to understand two words. And it's simple. Ministry and reconciliation. The word ministry is used 34 times in the Bible. And the word ministry is described simply as the office that delivers the execution of commands. Every Christian, every disciple is a part of the ministry of reconciliation. This isn't something that just the leaders are a part of. This isn't something that just your Bible talk leader lives by. This isn't something that just the evangelist Aaron and just the woman's ministry leader Sheila is a part of. This is the ministry that every Christian gets to be a part of with God. I hope you're fired up to be in the ministry of reconciliation. What that means is the Bible states that you are now a leader to the lost. You have a role in your relationships in the people of the world. That now you get to be someone that sets the example in Christ. You have to now walk with the purpose. It's important to understand this because we're all a part of this, brothers and sisters. This is the family that Jesus gave his life for, we to, for us to be a part of. Now, salvation itself is the result of reconciliation. So reconciliation is used four times in four verses. And it's summed up in two words. Word number one, exchange and restoration. The root of reconciliation essentially is to change. Now that changes from at odds with God to being at peace with God. Now, the cost of reconciliation is someone or something for a nation or a group of people. So essentially, it's giving a soul for many people. Now, for many of us, we understand that as a Christian, 
Really, we believe that that person who gave his life was Jesus. Jesus literally gave his soul so we can be reconciled with God. Meaning in reconciliation, reconciliation, the result of it is peace and harmony. Before Jesus died, there was nobody who had peace with God. There was no way to have harmony with God except for when he gave his soul for our salvation. So it's important to understand that now we got to regard Jesus and regard the world not from a worldly point of view. The Bible teaches that people aren't the way that we used to think they were. People aren't just celebrities anymore. People aren't just rich people anymore. People aren't just poor people anymore or middle class people anymore or your favorite artist or your favorite singer or your favorite athlete. People are now souls that need to be saved and added to God's kingdom. We got to see things spiritually. You guys with me here? We got to see things the way God sees it. We can't walk around idolizing people. We got to walk around as idolizing God. Amen. Turn your holy scriptures to Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5. Let's dive deeper into the ministry. In Romans chapter 5, the Bible reads in verse 6. Since we have now been justified by Jesus' blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. What's incredible right here is we got to understand, Jesus died for us while you were still a sinner. While you were still sinful, Jesus died for you. This is humbling. This is so humbling. That means that when you were at your worst, God saw you as valuable. When you thought you were worth nothing, when you thought your life was meaningless, when you had no purpose, God saw you and said, I'm willing to save your soul by giving my life. We oftentimes in America are conditioned to know that God is our savior. Jesus is our savior. But ultimately it's harder to connect to the cross because you've been conditioned with that statement. But naturally, it's ultimately the saving grace of God that you were born in a nation where Christianity is free, where we can walk around and have our Bibles open, where we could be around each other and worship God. That is the grace of God. Back in these times, these brothers and sisters are willing to die just from sharing the scriptures. They knew that that same person they're sharing with could be the very person to take them to Damascus and throw them in jail. They knew that being a part of the ministry of reconciliation meant that their lives may be at the price. Yet it was still worth it. You know, it's one thing to tell people to do something. It's a whole other thing to show people how to do something. And Jesus lived the example for us to follow, which takes us to point number one. Die to self in order to save somebody else. Die to self in order to save somebody else. You know, some of us aren't saving anybody because we're unwilling to die. We're unwilling to sacrifice. We're unwilling to give the glory Back on to our God. Let's read about it in John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, God has words for us. Jesus has his words here in John chapter 12. We've got to read it here in verse 20. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship 
at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee with the request. They said, sir, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. And Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man, thank you, to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. And the church said, Amen. I mean, this is incredible. I mean, these, these, these Greeks right here, they show up and they're like, man, we want to see Jesus. Where is he? And they're, they're walking around the feast. Where's Jesus? And they see Philip, poor Philip. Philip is brought up to the side, like, oh, you want to see Jesus? Um, uh, let me get some advice, because um, Andrew, um, dude, they, they came to see Jesus. I don't, I don't know what, what you think. Should we show them Jesus? And Jesus walks in the room. He says, hey, the hour of the Son to be glorified has come. I mean, talk about an introduction. I mean, how incredible would it be to see Jesus? Wouldn't that be awesome? You're just walking around, you're enjoying your day, and you're seeing the awesome, sunny, sunny, sunny California. And then all of a sudden, you don't just see the sun, you see the sun, you know what I'm talking about? And Jesus shows up, and you look in and you see Jesus, and you get to see him, and you're like, whoa, that's Jesus, oh my gosh. And you're running over, like, Jesus, I got to talk to you. And he's like, hey, hey, the son of man has come to be glorified. You kind of get taken back a little bit. You're, you're looking for like a hug, you know what I'm talking about? Usually like that's how the fellowship starts, you know what I'm talking about? Amen, guests, the first introduction to the church. And when you walk in, you, you're expecting that hug, but instead Jesus is ready to preach. Jesus didn't come to give hugs. You see, leadership ain't got nothing to do with hugs. Leadership got everything to do with preaching, serving, and administering God's grace. And Jesus... Jesus right here, I mean, you got to imagine Jesus was a cold brother. And Jesus, he walks in, you know, he's ready to preach, and he's telling him, listen, guys, the, the hour of me being glorified has come. But I'm going to tell you something. Some of y'all ain't ready to die. You following me, and you, you ain't ready to give up the drinking. You ain't ready to give up the partying. You ain't ready to give up impurity. You ain't ready to give up porn. You ain't ready to give up lust. You ain't ready to give up that relationship that's going to lead you to hell. I mean, some people are looking around, and they're looking at girls, and I tell you the truth, they better be hotter than hell because they ain't going to lead you to heaven. We've got to be men and women who are righteous in our relationships so we can get a relationship with God and go to heaven. Jesus wasn't playing games. And when Jesus was walking this earth, he, he had that message. He says, you got to be willing to die. I'm about to show you what it takes to produce many seeds. Wow. And oh, baby, everybody who comes to God, everybody who goes to heaven is the result of Jesus' willingness to die and produce many seeds. I mean, how many seeds can you produce if you give up Netflix? How many seeds can you produce if you give up Facebook? How many seeds can you produce if you're willing to just put aside and die to your sinful nature so you can be living, living the word of God? You know, when you come to terms with Jesus' teaching, you find that you are the only thing that hinders the ministry. You're the reason that the ministry doesn't grow. You're the reason that God can't be used through you. We hold God back 
by sinfully desiring our will and not his will. We're the reason why this room is in packed today. God is ready to fill it up. He wants people up those stairs walking around just about to fall off because the preacher's been preaching all night. That's what it was like in Paul's day. They were all fired up. They were like, oh, man, Paul's been preaching for 12 hours straight, but I'm sold out. I mean, that's what it was like in the first century. Why? Because they were willing to die because they literally saw Jesus. But for us, we got to have the faith that we can see Jesus every morning in our quiet times with God. Amen. This is so important. We've got to get ourselves out of, out of the way. We've got to carry our cross. We've got to crucify ourselves so we can save somebody else. I want to inspire you. I want to give you a challenge. Take aside moments every day. Take at least two minutes just to pray that you get to meet somebody that wants a relationship with God and that you get to share your faith with them so they can be a true disciple. You know what's left when you take yourself out of the equation? Do you know what's left behind? You get point number two. Point number two is love is all that is left when you die to yourself. Love is all that is left when you die to yourself. You know what's important? Everybody would know this and appreciate this. When you're in a relationship with somebody, isn't it a sad thing when that person's selfish? Yeah. Isn't that terrible? Yeah. When they're, thank you so much, my brother. Don't you just love Eric? Amen. Love Eric. We love Big E. We call him Big E, not Big E. Amen. Right. So those who don't understand. He, he, he's been had that nickname for a lot of years. Amen. I'm not dissing him. That's what we call him in, in Seattle. Um, but in a relationship, it's really sad when somebody's selfish. You know what I mean? It's disturbing. It's not helpful. It's not beneficial. And in the same way, you know, in our relationship with God, when we die to ourselves, we get a real relationship with that person. We get a real friendship with that person. And in a similar way, we get a real conversation with people when we actually die to ourselves. We get a real family when we actually aren't selfishly trying to seek the needs of our own selves but trying to help the needs of our brothers and sisters we enjoy a sport for a real way because now it's not about what you can do and your needs it's about helping the team we enjoy our cars and oh man some of us got some rough cars amen but we enjoy our cars because we're grateful for our cars because it's not about ourselves it's about the love that we get we enjoy school We enjoy school. Why? Because school isn't about you. School is about honoring God. We enjoy our our, uh, friendships with those people in the world and our careers. We enjoy our career. Why? Because you're honoring God in the middle of wicked coworkers. We enjoy and live a real religion, that true religion that only comes from God when we're actually prioritizing the love. You know, the very things that God has given us, he only asks that we love him and use things. Sadly, we oftentimes love things and use him. We expect God to be our genie, a little genie in a bottle. And yet God is so much more. He deserves your whole heart, your whole strength, your whole mind your whole being. He, he expects 400% capacity of love in his relationship with us. Let's read about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 one last time. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we've got to understand the motivation of what it takes to have that relationship with God. You guys still with me today? I mean, when we open the word of God, the Bible opens you up. So if you're feeling cut, feel good about it because God wanted you to get cut today. And we know that surgery is essential because we want to go through it now and not at Judgment Day. We want to be fired up today and not fired up at Judgment Day. You guys with me here? Let's read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. The Bible says, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. Because we know 
that he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. And the church said, Amen. you know, I wanted to lift up some disciples who are living to please God. I want to lift up our brother Willie. <laughs> Willie is an amazing disciple. I mean, I don't know anybody that comes to Devo's, who's not in the singles ministry, comes to campus Bible talks on his day off. I mean, he has days off, and his days off are truly exclusively serving the Lord. He just shows up to Bible talk. He's like, hey, bro, you on campus? Like, absolutely. He's like, all right, cool, I'm here too. Like, what? Aww. Willie is just an amazing example of serving God and loving people. Yeah. Willie is an incredible disciple. I love you so much, bro. I wanted to live up, lift up our sister, Kiki. Yeah. God don't got to ask Kiki if she love him. You know what I'm talking about? God knows that Kiki loves her. And she is such an incredible disciple. I mean, she showed up to our fundraising on Friday. I mean, she was helping everybody hit their missions. I mean, we're, we're going through the numbers, and she's like, hey, I helped her. I helped him. I helped her. I helped him. I helped her. I helped him. He's like, dang, sis. You're getting everybody's money. You, you, you are an amazing servant. She was there nice and early to serve. I mean, I love our dear sister. Aren't you just fired up for our dear sister, Kiki? I mean, God has given us incredible disciples in our ministry, and I, I'm very fired up about our dear brother, Jesse. Jesse is an incredible disciple. I mean, Jesse is someone who who really was seeking God, as you guys all know from last week, and how his heart is so just ripe for the harvest. I mean, God softened his heart so much. He loves God so deeply. And Jesse, on his own accord, there was, he found out a brother was, was struggling over, the, over a few days ago. And as a young Christian, he took it on himself just to go to that brother's house, to go and serve that brother, to hear that brother out, and to love that brother. And Jesse is just an incredible disciple who really wants to be fruitful for God. I love you so much, bro. You know, the question we got to ask ourselves is how do we love in this way. Let's close in 1 Peter chapter 4. In 1 Peter chapter 4. In 1 Peter chapter 4, the Bible literally says in verse 8, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. You know, we read that in the NIV, but it, it just doesn't connect well enough. Therefore, I wanted to read it to you in the Holman Christian Standard Version. It connects a whole lot deeper. The Bible says, above all, keep your love for one another at full strength. Since love covers a multitude of sins, we've got to do two things. We've got to, number one, understand how love works. And then we got to, number two, understand that your love makes a difference. Many of us don't really believe that we can make a difference in this world, so we don't love as hard as we know we should. I know for me, when I was 10 years old, I moved to, Chicago, moved to San Diego from Chicago. And in that setting, it was hard for me as a 10-year-old kid. I was a mama's boy. Amen. <laughs> And I was super close to my mom. My mom is who I live with, and she, she cooked for me every day. She was serving me. She took care of me as a 10-year-old kid. And it was the hardest decision at my youth was to leave my mother and move to San Diego. And in that moment, I remember waking up at 4 in the morning because she worked at the post office. And in that environment, I, I was there with my mom, and I knew she was going to go to work any minute, but she just stayed late for work because she didn't want to say goodbye to her son. And I remember just hugging her at about four in the morning all the way to about 5.15 and we didn't even say a word. We were just crying the whole time. Just, just in that moment, it was hard to say goodbye to my mom. And it was hard for her to say goodbye to me. And that moment really hurt me as a young Christian, as a young boy. And I moved to San Diego and 
inwardly, deep down, I never really committed myself to loving other people because I felt that I couldn't love my mom anymore. And as a child, as I grew older, I got older and I didn't say I love you to my dad. I didn't say I love you to my friends. I didn't say I love you to girls. I, I felt scared because deep down I had that pain of leaving my mother behind. I wasn't able to have love at its full strength. And then I got baptized. I studied the Bible. God really exposed the weaknesses in my heart. And one day as a young Christian, I shared for communion. And I was on the train and I'm, the whole day, I'm thinking it was in Boston. What am I going to share? What am I going to share? I don't know what I'm going to share. I don't have a message to share. I'm kind of scared. And I'm sitting on the, on the train and I'm, I'm in the train with this brother, Preston Inkley. And I immediately just had that memory of, of being a 10-year-old kid saying goodbye to my mom. And I just started bawling. And Preston's sitting across from me, and he's looking me in the eye, and he's like, he starts bawling. <laughs> and we're both just bawling. And then he eventually realizes, he's like, bro, what are we crying about? <laughs> and then I'm like, bro, I, I, I can't talk. You know? And he's like, bro, it's, it's going to be a great communion, huh? <laughs> and I'm like, yes, it will. And we just hugged each other. That night I called my mom and I said, Mom, thank you so much for loving me and being willing to give me over to my dad so my dad would raise me to be a man. I would not be the man I am today, Mom, wow. if you didn't have that sacrifice as a mother. Wow. I called my dad and I said, Dad, I love you, Dad. I love you so much. Thank you for loving me. And he's like, uh, uh, love you too, son. <laughs> And it's amazing to see what God's done when, when I decide to study the Bible and get that in out of my heart and really put love at its full capacity. But that's what we've all got to do. Yeah. We've all got to decide today to put love at full strength, meaning there's going to be moments where people will sin against you. It will happen. The Bible says a multitude of sins. But the amazing part is love covers all of it. <laughs> to God... You are worth it. To each other, we got to believe we are worth it. We've got to take this responsibility to love each other at its full capacity. I love you guys. I'm going to give you that challenge to honor God in our worship today. Amen. I love you guys. To God, we love you.